we are behind time, number one. Number two, um, I can hear the stomachs rumbling, so lunch is on the corner, and hence it's not very fair for me to uh, spend much time talking about what we're going to talk about. I think the topic is very clear, uh, what's next in technology for schools. And this word technology, I guess, is now no longer a new word to any of us. It's been doing the rounds for many, many uh, years now in the education space. Although I must confess that somewhere I think technology has still been under-leveraged in the education space if you really compare it to what it has done to other industries, uh, be it hospitality, be it transportation, be it automobile, mobile, etc. I think there's much, much more that we can really do with technology. Somewhere technology is seen as uh, uh, purely being connected to smart classes, interactive boards, uh, tablets, etc. I think but we can go much, much beyond that. We need to look at it more holistically. Uh, what can technology really do inside a classroom beyond these devices? Uh, and, 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 you know, really speaking, the sky is the limit if you really go deep into it. Uh, I would not want to talk any more about it. I'm just going to straight away go into the panel. I think we have a very esteemed panel out here. Interestingly, we've got four folks who are from academia and who represent the, uh, the, the academic institution, and we have one who represents the tech space. So I think between them, I'm sure we'll be able to pull uh, something off. Uh, I'm going to start with you, uh, Dr. Banerjee. I think I just want to quickly understand. Uh, now, Shiv Nadar schools is certainly one of the more progressive schools, and there is this whole area around innovation and design that you all work with. Now, the quick, honest question is, or the, the honest answer I want is, has this been done because technology is now a very integral part of the future for a child, or do you really believe that Part of the curriculum, you need to really have this so that the child gets more holistically advanced uh, as they grow uh, in through the schooling years. It is important, I guess, before I share the answer or probably uh, share my thoughts on this, what prompts any educator or any educational enterprise ought to be two things, which is the values enshrined in the Constitution. And now with a more global citizenship view, I think it is the sustainable development goals, the, the fourth industrial revolution and the 4.7, which is really something that we look deeply. And hence, whatever else as a tool, including technology, which, can, which is uh, the toolkit as well as the software, the yantra, tantra, and mantra of education, really. But it has to be understood in that, that it should ensure all learners acquire knowledge, skills needed to promote sustainable development. And then it's also about sustainable lifestyles. You cannot have an environment which is only about consumption of technology. So production and enterprise, entrepreneurship comes along with it. And then, of course, there is this most important value system, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace, non-violence, global citizenship, cultural diversity, and a contribution towards sustaining all of this. So, in short, the whole curriculum should be focused on enabling empathy, and that is why we concentrate on uh, design and programming, which is sometimes not to do with the hardware at all. To be able to have a system where you wash your own filth that you create, to generate something that you are using, and to empathize with society around you, because we are not just one school system, which is about privileges. You have children and learners coming from all backgrounds where sometimes it is just important to be able to hold your head high and say, I know I belong to people who are counted. So technology for us runs through the entire curriculum. You will find a kindergartner problem solving through design thinking to empathize, why are we fighting more during these months? Or how can we use less so that so-and-so does not have to pick up the bits of paper? So I think I would like to simplify it to the lowest common denominator. 
of curriculum design. What are we doing to make this a better world? That's where technology comes in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for those uh, opening comments. Uh, just a, just a follow-up question to you, ma'am. Uh, obviously, whatever you mentioned that technology is going to be enabling you to do, would cannot be done without a human touch to it. Especially some of the areas that you mentioned about, cannot be done without a human angle or a human touch to it. Now, how do you get the two to coexist? So I think if you look at, we've been talking and in the previous panels as well, and I liked the word which is what is used, relevance, you know. It's no more about privileges, it's about being relevant. And if the curriculum does not have space, does not incur and enable resources, the children can go out, think for themselves, solve a problem using everything, using science, technology, arts, music. And some of arts is for art's sake, but some of arts is also to make you a better person. So I think the environment needs to be equipped with resources, yes, but you don't only need the resources which are technology oriented in terms of hardware and software. What you need is a design. You need a design where a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old can dabble with ways and means, has toolkits to be able to express, to data mine, to co-create, to collaborate, and in the end, to make relevant learning happen. And through relevant learning, it is equally important to be able to see how you fit in and personalized learning, somebody was just sharing. I think technology is one thing that enables personalized learning and balances collaboration. It does not put you into a bubble of being exclusive. Right. And it's how you use it, I think. That's what it is. And I would really, I loved that topic of one of the panels which you have, which says, don't start fixing or mending what is not yet broken. So sometimes we get into this whole thing about starting to fix everything through some kind of a gimmick. So if joy of learning is something which gaming can provide, do it, but do it judiciously. So I think teacher training is very important. Teacher enabling, teacher empowering. We use technology as a toolkit for educators to be able to build what they think is relevant for a particular child or a whole cohort of children towards making life more worthwhile and of value. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to your a couple of points that you mentioned. But before that, just want to reach out to you, Mr. Bali. Uh, the Hyderabad Public School is in a city that is known to produce techies. And you know, in a way, even if you look at the recent news, uh, two very famous folks who are leading global companies, Microsoft and Adobe, after the city of Hyderabad. Now, does this put pressure on you as, in, as, a, as a school? Uh, do you come under pressure from the parents that technology has to really be the be all and end all of how academics has to be delivered in your school, simply because there is this whole uh, ethos of Hyderabad and, and tech which go hand in hand? Well, um, good afternoon everyone. Uh, the two tech giants which you mentioned, they're not just from Hyderabad, they're from my school. Oh, they are okay. the alumni of our school. I think that deserves a light, uh, slight round of applause, right? <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, uh, th those two are few of them. I, I think the time constraints, so I don't want to get into the list. Um, and interestingly, when they were in school, technology was not an important player in the country. And now they are leading the companies or heading the companies which are technol technological giants uh, in the world. So um, as an educator, um, I've never had a pressure from the parents to uh, introduce technology or, or get more technologically advanced, et cetera, et cetera. However, off late, uh, the conversations have started happening about AI, VR, um, augmented reality, etc., which is a very healthy sign. Um, we have um, more pressure of admission into school, and a lot of children who come into school from the part where I come from in Hyderabad, they feel everyone should go out and do engineering. And most of them feel that they should do software engineering. So the pressures are relatively different than the technology. Um, 
I personally believe that technology is here to stay. Uh, that's a fact. However, um, we as educators have to be very careful um, how we walk on that path of technological revolution. And uh, I think we have to very strongly keep a balance between the traditional skills and the technological skills. I uh, saw a few days back a particular school where robot is teaching in the classroom. I don't know if that's for good or for bad. I personally do not imagine a classroom without a teacher. Uh, because there is much more than just delivery of content which goes inside the classroom. And uh, uh, I think in the earlier panel discussion it was discussed that uh, playing sport, uh, playing a musical instrument, uh, doing social service or community service, interacting with people is equally important. So I want to bring uh, uh, the discussion on the panel towards the careful use of technology in future. Yes, it is here to stay, but we need to be very careful um, how we use it in future. Certainly well said because uh, technology, like any other man-made machine, can go berserk if you do not navigate it the right way, especially when you're dealing with children. I think the whole balance of EQ has to be extremely strong uh, when you deal with technology. Uh, again, you know, we'd like to kind of go back to a few of you for getting some passing, some extra comments on some other points that you made. But before that, uh, I'd like to come to you, Dr. Madhav. I think uh, uh, Sindhya School, I was just going through the video, right, the Sindhya Boarding School, and, and, and it's, a, it's a beautiful video. It's a, it's a good three and a half to four minute video. Uh, really talks about how the school is in a fort. Uh, excellent diligence and discipline that, that covers the whole uh, ecosystem of the school. Uh, good balance between sports and, and academics. Surprisingly, while there are so many schools in the country today, almost every school's website or every school's marketing material talks about technology, talks about robotics, talks about innovation. Somewhere in Sindhya, in, in, in your video, we had no, re no mention of it. Now, now, I'm sure that cannot be the case. So, so just want to, could you just throw some comments as to what, what are we missing here? Is that by design? Is that? I think we are very poor at marketing. <laughs> Second is that uh, gradually I have started realizing that it is good, it is a blessing to be a slow learner. Because so much is happening around and if you get caught up, you miss the real point. And especially when you are dealing with the future of your own kids. <clears throat> Uh, what uh, we have realized and what we have been following at high school is that education has got two, and that's our understanding, that education has got two distinct objectives. Education for livelihood and education for life. And it is a fact that technology is going to intrude and augment both the areas. So there is a strong acceptance. And, uh, and to address that, we have been working, and this is what I'm going to share, that how we are working. So the, the priority is the person. All of us know that these times are interesting, challenging times, and what is going to happen tomorrow, we are not sure. So you have to prepare yourself, and you have to prepare your child for unpredictable future. So unless you work on the child, on the person, as a whole, whether there is technology or there is no technology, actually it, it is not going to make any difference. That's why diligence, that's why sincerity, that's why uh, everything else you have talked about. On the other hand, we also understand that uh, it is not good to be good for nothing. So you have to prepare your child for livelihood and you have to prepare your child for uncertainty. So when we talk about livelihood, then uh, in high school, which is a fully residential boys' school from class six to 12. So till class nine, we have project-based learning. Uh, computer science is a compulsory subject. Each boy is given additional three hours per week. 
and that is under the care of experts from NIIT. There are tech part. Uh, there are tech partners. Uh, boys uh, work in their innovation lab, and they produce a lot of pro projects. So that is for livelihood. But on the other hand, we are also conscious of the fact that it is not only livelihood. Because the possibility is that most of them are going to be consumers. So are you grooming them into, be, into a responsible consumer or not? So this is what we have been doing, uh, doing together. And since there is acceptance, and it's not something that you should be boast about, perhaps that's the reason that it is not shown on our uh, website. I hope I am able to answer your question. To an extent, yes. Uh, yet, I, I, want to, I want to ask you a question. Given that it's a boarding school, and I'm sure it's driven by a lot of rules and regulations, do you have rules and regulations that uh, define whether a child in your school can, or, or a certain class can hold smartphones? And if yes, uh, yeah. do you have any restrictions on how long they can use it and how long they can't? Very fine balance. Class 9 onwards, uh, each child will have personal network. Uh, they will get five to six hours to uh, go on net every day. Uh, Facebook is not allowed, and every boy has a Facebook account. And uh, you cannot uh, have a video chat with your parents, that, but every second boy will have a video chat with the parents. And in class 11 and 12, they will have video chat with their girlfriends. And, and uh, so uh, there are rules and regulations, but these kids outsmart us. They will continue doing that. We, last week we had valedictory uh, ceremony for class 12 boys. And the gift was on the presentation, dear Dr. Saraswat, this is your password. <laughs> it was hacked. Now the fact is that what kind of trust system you have with the kids. What kind of courage and conviction you have in your kids to allow them for these things. Uh, I think this is what we should be uh, questioning ourselves and it depends from one school to another school. I'm fortunate that I have got only 550 boys. I'm fortunate that I'm a fully boarding school because I fully re I understand and appreciate that it is much, much, much more difficult in day schools where t parents are sitting on your head. So we get a lot of time and a lot of opportunities to engage with our kids and we accept them the way they are and this is the real world. Either you accept it or you make life miserable for yourself as well as for your kids. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, response. Uh, similar to the Sandhya school, uh, Ms. Vasudatta, your school has a lot of emphasis on uh, experiential learning, but beyond that there is a certain gurukul system that, that you all follow, this whole open space learning. Uh, again, in your school I haven't seen too much of m emphasis on technology. And yet I'm sure there is technology in some form that, that drives the ecosystem of your school. So again, it's a very similar question that I have for you. How do you, so what, so, so open schooling or rather getting people to come into learning spaces outside your classroom is to really make them probably be more absorbent to what they're learning. And yet, if you, if you do not have those tablets and interactive boards which most of the schools follow, perhaps the learning outcomes are not as interesting as what a lot of them say. Is there a blend? Do you, do you get these two to merge and do something around it or? Good afternoon everyone. Yes, to answer your question there, what we have in school is what is called a problem-based learning. Now we have to accept that technology has really taken over the world and taken education to a whole new different level. And technology dictates everything, the way we work, the way we interact, the way we shop and the way we learn. And there's a lot of information out there which needs to be harnessed. And it is through this curriculum specific, we transact the curriculum. Now it's done through two main activities. It's called the GITS, which is getting in the zone. And then it's taken through a I lead cycle. Now technology does play a huge role in it, but then we also take into account that a teacher needs to be there 
not as the central figure, because in a PBL classroom, it is the learner who is the main focus. And the teacher is just a facilitator on the side and encourages the child to move along and take charge of his own learning using all the relevant information that is there. So how do we do it? We get an activity that happens first, which is called the GITS, as I said, getting in the zone. And then the children are encouraged to ask a lot of questions. And those questions lead to research work. So they I think, and then they I plan. And it is in that I plan situation where children are asked to research, they are encouraged to dive deep into the concepts, to explore with the teacher as the facilitator, read books also. From there they go into a I plan and a I lead cycle because most of the learning starts with identifying a real world problem. And they look at the community around them, they identify a problem, and then it feeds in with the PBL pedagogy and the concepts that are there in the curriculum because they think of a driving question that will help serve society. So they think of that, they critically research it, and then they come up with an end product. For instance, it could be water purifiers for the community because there is no drinking water there. So they go through this entire cycle with the help of the teacher. And in our PBL classrooms, we feel that knowledge is beyond books. So Vega Schools is an absolute no book policy. We don't have textbooks at all. We encourage children to read. We encourage children to explore, to research, to go out into the world of connectivity internet with the help of the teacher next to them. And because with easy access to information, the role of the facilitator has changed, we have also incorporated a lot of other changes because technology as an enabler now makes for greater interaction with different parts of the world. So in Vega, we have no closed learning uh, classrooms. We have open learning spaces, which is very different from the open school system that you mentioned. I meant open learning spaces. Yeah. So we have open learning spaces and we have flexible furniture and we have movable walls that can be quickly reshaped to meet any learning requirement. That's how we do it there. And we make sure that the learner is always at the center. And what is our main focus? Our main focus is not on technology. Our main focus is on innovative real learning. It is on learning that comes with using best practices all over and then helps our children become creative and independent thinkers, collaborators, communicators, all of the 21st century skills that are required. Our focus is on the open learning spaces where we ask a teacher to use technology in the best possible way and maybe use other material also. And we also encourage the learner also to use technology and other resources in the best possible way. Our emphasis again is on the entire learning environment that is there in the cloud so that we can have more collaboration with outside schools. We are members of the Global School Association, which is uh, by invitation only, and we are one of the 10. And so we have Skype lessons with them also, Skype classes that we set up with them so that there is, is an exchange of ideas between all of them. And more than that, our main focus also is how to adapt and customize technology so that it can help all our learners, because we have children with special needs too in our school. So how is it that we can reach out to them? Just as we reach out to our learners with different learning requirements, using different teaching strategies, we also focus on technology, allowing our learners to use the best possible that would help them. So education is uh, lifelong, learning is lifelong, and the future of education is really very, very exciting. But our main focus actually is on creating global citizens because they have to live in this real world and the needs of the job market is changing very, very rapidly. The landscape is changing. So our main focus is to create global citizens who live in a digital world with all the right skills that will help them take up the challenges that come in the real world. We no longer have education. Earlier education was structured to meet a very specific economic system which was based on industrialization and manufacture. Currently, our economy is based on knowledge and technology, and our learners should be able to live up to the challenge to meet everything with the kind of knowledge that we give them. And therefore, our main focus is having the learner in the center with the facilitator by the side, using the PBL pedagogy to sure. go through just, life. Just one question. When you talked about learner, 
do you also include teachers in that learning? Uh, yes. So our learner is the learner. Teachers, we refer to them as learning leaders. Right. So that they also, do you use technology also to provide learning? We have a very fine balance between the learning leader, the learner, and technology. Uh, the teachers also are put through uh, a lot of training programs. Was that your question? Yeah. I'm just so trying to figure out where all technology is used, not just yes. for students. So it's not just for the students, it's for the teachers as well. And the role of teachers is very, very important because it's a holistic experience that we're giving our learners. And EQ, I think, is far more important than IQ because that is what helps a child navigate through life because they need very specific skills of collaboration, of communication, of empathy. And these are, in fact, skills that were put up by the World Economic Forum, saying that these are the required skills for the next decade. Right. And therefore, those are the main ones that we focus on. Right. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amit, I'm just going to you know, come to you now. Uh, you are the EdTech ed representative in this group. And you obviously are on the other side of the table. Now, you've been interacting with a lot of academicians, school leaders, principals. Uh, your organization, as I understand, conducts a lot of robotic competitions. So in a way, uh, are you worried about what Mr. Bali said about this whole robot in the school? Because I, I guess that's something that you might, you might be wanting to do at some point of time, right? So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amit. And uh, like uh, uh, Vinish said, uh, I, uh, I sit on the other side of the table. And uh, rather than uh, saying the other side, I would say I represent a community of uh, students who, so I was always like a, an average student in my class. And I always uh, try to find ways what we uh, don't want to do in schools, you know, the things we don't want to do. And uh, like uh, Sir uh, just mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, Facebook is not allowed in school. Nobody use Facebook these days. We are on Snapchat and Instagram. Right. So uh, when we are talking about uh, these uh, millennials, we are talking about these new kids, we have to think what, uh, what is their mindset, how and what is something they, are, uh, they wanted uh, out of, uh, you know, our as a community, uh, when, we, uh, when they look at the schools or people like me or anybody where uh, they want to go in and uh, learn anything out. Uh, so, uh, so there is a very uh, fine line uh, uh, when we define our job is uh, we don't uh, really emphasize on building knowledge because knowledge, like everybody said, that it's available everywhere. So we emphasize on building skills and that's where the world is going to be where uh, uh, you, nobody is going to ask you that, uh, hey, what is the capital of Pan uh, Goa? You know that it's Panchim and uh, you can just uh, do a Google search and find it out. But what is something you're going to put it as a keyword and what is something is going to give you an answer or what is Google actually or how you go on the internet and find that answer is a skill which uh, is going to be really important afterwards. You don't need that also, right? You can just ask Alexa. Uh, that's, that's a second step. Uh, you know, Alexa is going to be uh, very easy but uh, sometime mundane. Uh, it's going to be very uh, simple for uh, millennials. Uh, so uh, when we talk about these guys, they want something to be complicated uh, as well as like exciting. So when you look at Alexa and when you ask these guys that, hey, how much time do you spend uh, with Alexa, you know, over a day, you may find an answer like five minutes or 10 minutes. But when you look at and uh, ask the same question that how much time do you spend on Snapchat, right? And that's where you get your answer because uh, what these, uh, this generation is basically looking at is uh, the skills which has the complexities and which is going to be challenging them on a daily basis. It is not going to be something which, uh, hey, I have learned and now I know. Uh, and that uh, relates to another point uh, which uh, uh, there was a morning discussion that we, uh, the ATL, the Adult Tinkering Labs, uh, the idea is to start as early as sixth grade. See, when you're teaching somebody uh, who is in sixth grade, which means they are already at eight or ten years, right? Uh, the ideal way, uh, the age of learning uh, when uh, we look at the numbers is going to be from three years to seven years. That means we are missing out the golden period of the learning when we, uh, we can emphasize these skills. When you look at any child, uh, say, the learning pattern or the skill building abilities, you see that uh, by the age of five, we know how to swim, uh, how to cycle, walk, run, play any games, and then we start practicing those things at the age of six or eight. Uh, by the seven years, uh, we actually move out of uh, you know, choosing our skills, and uh, then we go in and develop those skills further. 
uh, that's exactly what uh, the point we mentioned when we put, uh, put up technology that uh, when you're talking about coding, so coding can also be a skill rather than just a language or a, or a learning tool because uh, the way you learn, say Hindi, English, Marathi, I, I come from Mumbai, so uh, Marathi is always a, a challenge because I'm a Delhi height and uh, moved to Mumbai. Now I don't know what, uh, how to teach Marathi to my uh, child. So that's where I use technology. So as a parent also, the exposure of technology in education is so high that uh, I cannot ask my child that, hey, you should move away from technology or you should not be doing this. It's like I drive BMW and I'm asking my child to go to school uh, you know, with a local bus. So, so the challenge comes in that uh, they are always going to be exposed to this. Uh, when Sir mentioned that uh, in school uh, there is a restriction that uh, they can use some things and they cannot use something else. Uh, usually in boarding schools when these kids go back to their house uh, you know, during vacation, they get exposed to everything. You know, they, they are, uh, nobody says that, hey, you should not be watching TV or you should not be playing games or should not be doing XYZ things because they like to do everything which is not available there. And that's where the exposure comes in. So the point here is, uh, when we talk about the, uh, the exposure towards technology in education, there is no restriction which we can uh, actually put in. It's like, uh, you know, the same example uh, which we saw out of, uh, you know, the, the era of computers, when uh, we thought that, hey, computers are going to come in and they're going to take away jobs and, you know, this, that thing happened. And now you look at how uh, we have changed India as a, a global office, we call it as, uh, rather than uh, just a pure nation, because we export engineers now. And, and just to add to that point, India is not a consumer, uh, you know, it, it may not be a consumer nation going forward because when you look at the number of startups coming in India, it's uh, the third highest in the world uh, after US and UK. And when you look at uh, the kind of innovation which are happening through these startups, so people are no longer looking at creating uh, or learning uh, to get into jobs. They are actually creating those jobs. And that's where the emphasis is going to be that how I can create something as an idea which is going to elate into a, a, a job opportunities for others, which is a scalable model which can be taken globally. So now we are looking at a, a very different gamut of uh, skills which we are trying to develop using technology in education. Sure, I'm, I'm sure you want to talk much more, but yeah, uh, sure. unfortunately yeah, we are having a time constraint. I, I, you know, we'd like to go through another round of some points out here, but unfortunately 30 minutes is not enough to talk about this deep topic. But before we ask the audience a couple of questions, I want to ask you one question, Mr. Bali. Uh, imagine that in front of you now, both Mr. Nadela and Mr. Narayan are standing. Okay, they have come back to the school, Eluminus, and they're saying that I've got a billion dollars now to invest into your school, into technology. What would you like to do with that money? What is the next in technology that you'd like to bring in? See, um, Technology has brought uh, a really revolution in education, no doubt about it. For example, I'm a, I'm a geographer. So when I used to teach or study geography, so I studied about plates, I studied about volcanoes, I studied about the universe. With augmented reality, you can actually see it happening and feel it. So there's so much which you can do with technology in education. But what um, uh, I was talking to Dr. Saraswath a little while ago is that unfortunately, um, at least in India, I don't know about the, how the other parts are dealing, at least in India, we are, we are getting obsessed with this word of technology. Uh, Over-obsessed, rather. Uh, just having smart boards in the classroom does not mean you, you, you are doing justice with technology. Just by allowing cell phones or allowing uh, laptops means that you are doing justice with technology. And uh, that's where uh, the balance has to be seen. So if those two gentlemen are standing in front of me saying we want to invest billion dollars in, in technological innovation in the school, um, I'll be very careful as to how we invest that money, uh, what kind of things we do. AI, definitely yes. Uh, virtual reality, yes. Augmented reality, yes. But uh, that does not mean that I'm going to give a gadget on each child's hand uh, for the entire time in the school. Um, there is there is a long-lasting um, benefit of, like, like uh, the fellow panelist said a little while ago, that by the time students uh, come in a boarding school at the age of 12, they've already missed out that time of technological whatever. Um, but it's also important that uh, discipline, prioritization, 
is also taught in the school because that also has to be taught early in life. Um, you can't um, have everything being served on the plate. Um, so technology has to be there, but it needs to be handled very carefully. At the same time, equal importance has to be given to the soft skills and the mental toughness of the child because the future is very scary and exciting at the same time. And the children who are going to succeed tomorrow is not because of technology, but because of the mindset that they can handle that technology or not. Sure. Thank you. Sure, no, thanks a lot. Uh